According to the 2022 Data Breach Investigations Report, the human remains the number one driver of breaches today, demonstrating that cybersecurity is no longer just a technical challenge, but a human one as well. But how do you manage the human risks of cybersecurity? It starts with measurement. Only by effectively quantifying human risk can organizations engage employees with relevant activities to truly change human behavior. That's human risk management. Map key human behaviors to the business risks that matter most to your organization for free by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash living security. Application Security Weekly delivers interviews and news from the worlds of AppSec, DevOps, and all the other ways people find and fix software flaws. Join us as we explore how the latest news highlights modern security practices or reminds us of the missing ones. We also bring insights from interviews on topics from training to threat model, from open source tools to cloud native techniques plus an occasional reference from new wave to synth wave. Find us at securityweekly.com slash subscribe or look for Application Security Weekly wherever you pick your podcasts. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Ben Carr and Josh Marpet. Follow us on LinkedIn for updates across our organization, show highlights, and more. You can find us by searching for Security Weekly Productions. All right, gentlemen, we went a little over on the first segment, but we had such a good discussion. I, I, I wanted it to go a little longer. And these articles are going to reinforce some of that conversation. So article number one, the seven questions boards, board members want answers to. Uh, it, I, I think we almost covered all these on the last segment, by the way. Um, <laughs> some of them but probably a, a little deeper than others. <laughs> yeah, look, I... I I think if you're trying to answer seven questions for the board, you're missing out. But yeah, I guess at the core, this does get to it. And we did talk through a lot of these. I mean, I think the, the board's really interested in is the spend worth it, right? And what's the value prop we're getting out of it or what's the ROI, right, that we're going to see out of this. And hopefully you can map it back to business goals and business objectives. And if you can do that, I think you're you're aligned with success for for what the board wants to know. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the alignment to the business objectives and is it addressing the risks, which ties back into the previous segment a little bit, right? Is if risks if the risks are around availability, right? And it's not around free flow of information, then are we spending the right dollars in the right places to enable the business and reduce the risks? Which I could almost ask every corporate board out there and be like, well, why are we spending money on this stuff when this stuff matters? Like, I don't, I still don't see alignment yet. I just, after the last conversation, I just think we're spending the money on just some of the wrong stuff. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, stuff I, that I, is popular. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, go ahead, Josh. You, we're, we're spending the money on stuff that is popular or is in the news, has caught somebody's attention. We're spending the money on stuff that 10 years ago we were all talking about, five years ago we were all talking about. Unfortunately, we're not spending the money on the things as we've raised a new generation of CISOs and a new generation of security executives who actually understand what business is. It's going to take another five years before we focus on the things that they go now. Yeah, that'd be really cool if we could do that. You know, we're, we spent 20 minutes just now, or 10 minutes, whatever it was, talking about how risk uh, quantification needs to be continuous and, and dynamic. That won't happen for three to five years. I hope it happens sooner, but I don't see it. It takes time for these things to spin up. Yeah, and, and I think one of the one of the biggest problems we look at is uh, sometimes the things we're spending money on are regulatory issues that really are behind the times and aren't really something we should, every business area should be spending money on, right? Or as much money as they are. I think we're not we're not answering the right questions. And what we talked about, like you said, risk quantification. How do you get there? How do we get there? I, I think, and I'd love to see it in three to five years, but I think even that's optimistic. Yeah, and that's why the regu- the the alignment to the regulatory requirements, I think, is the wrong question to answer. Yeah, hundred percent. Like it, yeah. it, if it is truly about risk and business alignment, those are the only two questions the board needs to have answers to. Like, otherwise, we're just, we're doing things for the sake of doing things, and they're not actually addressing the real risks of the business or the things I need to focus on. Like, this is where the the whole regulatory compliance thing just, it just, it's such a miss, I think, right now with where businesses are and what actually needs to get done. It's just, it's just that, that miss still. Yeah, agreed. So. 
cybersecurity is a CFO issue. It is <laughs> because they, they, they have the money. I mean, it's, it's well, literally that simple. Actually, for years, I've been advocating that if CISOs are not reporting to the CEO, they should report to the CFO. Why? Because if you've got to protect the business as security and you're protecting revenue, do you know who really cares about revenue is the CFO, okay? And if the, you go, look, I need to spend $100,000 to protect $5 million in revenue, the CFO is going to be like, yeah, go ahead and do it. I'll make it in the budget. I, I, I'm the button that makes the budget. I'll put it in the budget. Done. Don't even worry about it. Plan it. You're getting it next quarter. Okay. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's awesome, isn't it? So when you build that rapport, that relationship with the person who has the purse strings, life is good. Yeah. I, I think if you can make that argument and get, get the buy-in, then certainly CFO is one of your best partners, right? Um, and it should be. I mean, too many, I think, CISOs go into this role and don't make alignment to the CFO. And I think that's really important. Uh, the challenge is sometimes that it's seen as misalignment and it's seen as money misspent. And so that's really hard to overcome if that's the case. Um, I think my challenge with this article was in general that, look, I, I, if you're doing security white, you are doing it as a, in, the, in the risk lens. Um, I, I do think that that reporting structure should be the CEO, but it, it means that you have to have the right empowerment and the right alignment and the right lens, that risk lens, to be able to function in that way. Um, if you're just assigning this out, whether it's the CIO, the CFO, legal, wherever it is, and it's just to stick it there, that's, that's the wrong lens to, to put it in from the, from the C-level, I think. Yeah, but I think the CFO is a very valid conversation because, as we said on the last, previous segment, is, look, they own the purse strings. They're the ones that, that are going to either fund this stuff or not, in most respects, right, working across the business. And again, if, if this is really an availability issue, it's all about figuring out how to make the business resilient and keep it up and running so that the dollars keep flowing. That sounds a whole heck of a lot like a CFO focus to me. Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to what's who's your CFO? <laughs> what's their insight and how do they look at it, right? Um, that That's always been the challenge. I mean, one could make that same argument from a CIO perspective, right? That the CIO should sit under the CFO too then, right? Because it's an availability issue. And that's actually, I've seen that 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 work where that, that's been the case. Um, I, I think it's it's a really valid place to look at it. I think it's just the the lens of how, how the, the different parties see themselves and see the people that are reporting to them and that, if that alignment's going to work. It, it can be a very successful place to put it in an organization. Yeah, agreed. So this third article, I even am now thinking, is this even a valid article? Like, after the last conversation we just had, and, and we walk through this, like, progression of the CISO role, like, do CISOs even have a chance in hell of landing a board seat? Probably not in its existing role or its current kind of incarnation of the role. I'm just curious. Like, this was, he, I put this in here thinking, you know, this would be a good alignment to the, the previous discussion based on the topic. And then I'm, I sat back and listened to that topic going, wait a minute, like, I, I don't even know if this is a, a possibility for CISOs. So it is and it isn't. Well, the SEC is mandating cybersecurity expertise on the board. Does that mean that you're, the CISO has to be on the board? Absolutely not. It means that you have to have somebody on the board who understands cybersecurity, at least a broad, in broad strokes, okay? Uh, that's being mandated because they're basically saying that ignorance is no excuse if you have a breach. Uh, I'm, I'm simplifying and bastardizing, but you get the idea. The, uh, uh, so you don't have an excuse when it comes, you have to have somebody who understands cybersecurity on the board. Could they take an executive course on it from, you know, whatever, and, and that counts? Yeah, absolutely. But what you should have is you should have at least a cybersecurity steering committee where the CISO is a member of the steering committee so that if there is a cybersecurity question, the CISO can be consulted, okay? So can the CISO get on the board? Will they have a seat on the board? Pro probably not, I'm not going to lie. Will they have influence on the board? Absolutely. They should at a reasonably well-run company. That's my take. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with you, Josh, in the percent, in the perspective of if the question is, is the, is the CISO of your company going to be on your board? And I would probably say I would agree that that wouldn't be correct, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate that necessarily. But I do think that there's a spot for 
people with background and experience in the industry to be on the board of other companies if they're looking for people who have that. But along with that comes the mandate that you're going to have to have other experience, right? Um, yeah. But to Matt's question on this, like, is this qu- even relevant? I guess it's a question of like, what are you expecting this? What are you expecting the role to be? What are we looking for for this, right? And I, I would say it all comes down to incentivizing people in the right ways for the behavior you're actually expecting to get out of it. And you know, to go back to the availability question. From an IT perspective, if we incentivize only on availability, nothing will ever get patched or fixed because that contradicts availability, right? Anytime we patch or fix or do something to remediate something, it takes the system down and it impacts availability. So in my experience, if you ask your people who are doing maintenance monitoring um, to only look at availability, you'll have very poor response to get things remediated and fixed. If you say also you need quality and security as part of the things you're monitoring against, then I think you, all of a sudden you see those scores raise up and it becomes a balanced conversation. In the same way, if the SEC is only saying, hey, we just want somebody who's taken a four-hour course, that's all you'll ever get, right? But if, mm-hmm. if shareholders in the SEC actually say, what we're actually looking is for companies to look at risk in the right way, and if cyber is your number one risk, you need somebody who has some core experience. If your company is a digitally-based company, which most are, then I think that's a different conversation and you need to have different experience level on the board. I just don't think companies are looking at it that way, right? Um, they're just looking at it as how do we get, how do we get a, a check the box mentality, which goes back to the compliance question. Right. No, you're right. It goes right back to the compliance question. If all, there, <laughs> if all we have to do is just check the box that I, I have someone with expertise on the board, that's all you're going to get. Check. Right. And Done. then, but that's why the new standards that are out there are being written in a, uh, a practical point of view. They're being written to say, you know, you can't, you, you have to have EDR. Yeah, we've got EDR. It's on those five machines. Go away. You know, check the box, be done. Most of the standards that are being written are being written from a, a not a prescriptive, but a, but a descriptive point of view now, which is to say, you have to be able to protect against ransomware. It used to be, you'd have to have an anti-ransomware system. We do. It's on the shelf. Can't you see it? It's in the clear plastic wrap. Okay. Uh, Now you have to show that you are protecting your systems against ransomware. I'm using that as an example. And so checking the box becomes much less, much, much less easy, much less just cost of doing business. You actually have to demonstrate these things. And the certification is much harder. And more and more of these standards are coming with certification, not just, yeah, yeah, here's our self-assessment. Have a nice day. So yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, the, the, so here's the other side of that coin, right? If we don't tell them what to do, then now we leave it open to interpretation, which leads us right back down a very interesting pathway that got us here in the first place. Now, I'm not a big believer that you have to mandate everything. I'm just saying that if without clarity, it gets very difficult to do this right. And I'm just, yeah. I, I just question whether we're doing the right things with enough clarity to actually make a difference or make an impact here. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, This next article is, uh, if you still want to be a CISO, here are some career path insights that you might want to um, account for, or you can just abandon the industry altogether like all the other CISOs that are, are leaving the industry and just saying, Hey, it's not worth it. But <laughs> how many, how many security Look, people I, do you know, have a, a hobby that's a handicraft, whether it's Jack Daniel making guitars or Mike poor making knives or, you know, uh, other people go shooting, other people go horseback riding, you know, Jim McMurray has his barrel racing horses. Like how many of us do you're you like, asking how do people out? keep their sanity? Uh huh. Is that what it gets to? Yeah, it's the yeah, it's the sanity. Um, look, I, I think career path insights, these are all these are all great, but these apply I mean to anything, right? Like these aren't these aren't CISO career paths insights. CISO career paths insights should be much more tailored. Um, yeah. Uh, this no, is no that leadership can't. insight. Yeah. yeah. You you've gotta you've gotta find somebody who's on the board to be your partner and you know understands the value of you know appropriate risk decision making like that that would be much more tailored to see superpass insights than this this very generic 
information. <laughs> All right. Next. I like this one. So, a lot on MGM and Caesar's attack. Are there any real takeaways we should take from the attack? Because when I read this article, I didn't get any. Mm -mm. No, I don't think there was much here. I mean, I think only time's going to tell if actually anything changes as a result of any of these attacks. I mean, honestly, we haven't seen much. I mean, there's there's a, you know a large attack. People want to put out learnings about it, and what they see is how's the industry going to need to change. Um, we make some small inroads there over the next three to six months, and then it's the next thing that happens, and we've lost interest. I, I just haven't seen. And I, I can't think of one where we've seen something we've said, oh, we've we've just really changed fundamentally and we're on a better path now. It it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem I'm, to be the track. I'm gonna disagree slightly. And and only in this specific case. And the reason I'm gonna disagree slightly is because very clearly everything is connected to everything in the MGM world, right? Otherwise, why would the elevators be connected to the reservation system, be connected to the credit card system? Ransomware should not have been able to 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 jump segments this easily. Okay, and you're like, well, a lot of companies, that, no, 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 no. This was way too fast, way too significant. And cross casino. Why are cross, why are multiple casinos affected? One casino could have been affected. Yeah, totally, got it. Why are multiple casinos affected? I will tell you that years ago, most casino networks were so flat, you could plug in something in one port in mm -hmm. one casino and talk to another machine directly in the same subnet at another machine 20, you know, all the way down the strip, okay? I do not know if that is the way with MGM. I do not have any crystal ball or any inside information, but what I will say is it's slightly suspicious that this is the case, that it happened this way. To the point where I would say their network is probably pretty damn flat with minimal network segmentation, if any, and um, <clears throat> that's not good. Yeah, so, so that's not even some... in the right. So that's not even in the insights. Like you just brought out a really interesting insight: micro segmentation. Like we should segment our networks; shouldn't be flat. Instead, this article goes, "Well, it's time to upskill. Upskill what? Like really? I'm going to go down generative AI, and that would have stopped this attack? No. Uh, managing risk, and then all the risks are related to things like security awareness and training, and things like that's not real risk management to me. That's just that, yeah, that's not, like yeah. that's. The, the, the tip of the iceberg You're like not even so scratching much, the surface <laughs> right there's so much more to risk management that's not even covered and then the last one bring security to everyone like haven't we tried this for how long this is why security awareness training and phishing simulation has, has not moved the needle Fails. on the human side it just has not it has failed miserably look at the last 16 dbirs we haven't moved the needle let me ask a question. This is you know what stops ransomware in its tracks is network segmentation, proper authentication and authorization barriers, and backing your shit up. Okay, and testing your restores. Oh my god, oh my god. My grandpa talked about, you know, grandfather, father, son, backup tape backup routines. You know what works? Grandfather, father, son, or I don't care if you do grandmother. Yeah, but mother, people don't do that daughter. anymore because it's all in the cloud. So we don't have to do that anymore. Because the cloud takes Except care the of cloud us. does not mean hyper <laughs> does not mean hyper secure or hyper backed up. It means hyper available. I but if you I agree with you. I agree with you, but it's but it's like how many organizations where it's just not even done. People don't even practice DR recovery plans anymore to see if they can get backups. The uh, Gauss on Discord is going good operational hygiene. Oh my God, keep your shit clean, people. Learn how to back <laughs> stuff up and restore your backups. Do your stuff that that that, that, that even on somebody else's computer cloud. Okay, it's still clean. It's still done properly. You know, there's a sense of pride in in the old days. And uh, you know, ah, get off my lawn, son. Whatever. Get out of. What's that cloud up there? In the old days, you you, you tucked your tapes away every week or your or every mm -hmm. month or every day or every whatever, and you knew that could and you tested every frigging month. I don't care what come hell or high water. The end of the month came. You tested that you could restore server X. Okay, or server Y or server Z, and you rotate it. Okay, over the course of a year or two, I could test every single goddamn server and every single goddamn data repository and know that I had a, ba a solid backup that was restorable and usable in case of an emergency. Why do we not do that anymore? Cloud does not do that for you unless you oh. have purchased the additional services necessary to make that happen. Yep. 
Rant over. We moved to the cloud. Magic happened. And we wonder why. We had the previous segment, how digital transformation pros for risk management, because we just stopped doing the, like the fundamentals. <laughs> we just stopped it. Fundamentals? Matt, are you stuck on these fundamentals again? Man, you talk about fundamentals like every goddamn show. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> just do the fundamentals and your security will be okay? Oh my God, who would have ever thought of that? All of the hosts on every show on Security Weekly for, I don't know, the last 20 years? Yeah. I just, you just don't need it. I mean, if you move to the cloud, fundamentals, they go away. You don't need to fundamentally do anything. Ben, I'm going to reach right, just through trust. the screen and I'm going to smack you no inside the fucking head. <laughs> it's like magic. All right. One last article, uh, the MACE Act. It, I'm curious, Josh, did you, have you seen, have you dug into this yet? I no, mean, I, I think not. it's a good move in order to move hiring practices in the federal government and not have so heavy of education. I mean, I wish Jason would have been on this one because we've talked about this a ton on this show. It looks like the federal government's going to make some moves to loosen up the requirements around education and other things to get the right skill sets into the government. I was just curious whether you've, you've had an opportunity to dig into this one. I haven't, but you know, education is interesting. I was actually talking with my wife. She's fascinated by this issue. Uh, you know, after World War II, we actually put engineering education into our schools. You know, when you learn calculus and trigonometry and everything else, you're learning engineering math. They're, they're, they've been changing that slightly in certain schools to be practical math, and they've been changing it at certain other schools to be data analytics math. So it's, it's fascinating that what we think of as reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, when you start talking education and stuff, and I realize this is a little basic, but bear with me for a second. <clears throat> the, the viewpoint was, let's teach these kids how to manufacture things. Because remember, World War II was all about manufacturing. Could you manufacture a new battleship, a new destroyer, a new tank, a new rifle, whatever? So that was the focus. Now, when you focus on certain types of math, you ignore other types of math. And you only get back into them at very high levels of education. When we focus on pen testing in security, how many people go, I want to be a pen tester, not I want to be a sock analyst, you know? When, and I'm not saying that's desirable, it can be for some people, but uh, when you focus on a certain way, you're, you're ignoring the rest. But, sorry, rant over again. No, but I, 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 we tend to agree, right? I mean, we've talked about this. Like, you don't necessarily need a bachelor's of science degree oh, of to, course not. to have skill sets in, in the cybersecurity space, right? But then every job description requires 10 plus years of experience and a BS. And it looks like in the federal government, that's not going to be the case. Like this act is supposed to remove some of that and look at the skill sets, not necessarily the education in order to fulfill these jobs. And I think this is a good step forward for the industry to get their arms around some of these issues that are also affecting corporate America. So. I think That's why that I in government out. and in corporate America, we should be apprenticing people to the, the branch that they want to go into, because I will tell you that, uh, and pay them bupkis wages, don't get me wrong, and I'm, and I'm sorry if you don't like this, but if you're an apprentice and I'm teaching you and training you and taking my time to teach you and train you, then I'm going to teach you the right way to do things, and I'm going to teach you the, the proper way to do things, and then you're going to go to school once you figure out, oh, wow, I really love this shit. And I love this aspect of it. Go to school for that, okay? But uh, you get the fundamental skills that I need you to have at this company in this in, in system. And when you get finished with school, you'll come back, you get a job here, no problem. Why yep. are fundamental skills only seen to be gotten in college? I've, I've taught college. And most of the time when I teach college, you know, I get to teach what I want to teach, which is what I think is the, the proper way to teach it. Uh, based on, you know, based on science and based on what I, a little bit of my beliefs, I'm not going to lie. But when I teach, some colleges teach by PowerPoint and you get deaf by PowerPoint to learn how to do computer science. That's not going to teach you computer science, man. It's not. Nope. So the way I learned was to, you, you wanted to, I had to build an assembler. I, I, that's, I, that was one of the first courses in my master's program, build an assembler. Like you got to build it. You can't just PowerPoint your way through understanding what a what, what an assembler does until you actually build it. Yeah, there's a practicality Dude, I, of the experience that you need. I taught a course yeah. at a college, and I wish I hadn't accepted it. I, they 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 begged. I had friends there. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll teach it for you. And I, it was a you know you know Security Plus, the CompTIA Security Plus exam. I mean, it's a yeah. basic course. It was a prep course for that, and it was. I'm like, all right, it's basic stuff. It's not a big deal. They they said we've got all the materials. You just and I stepped into the class, and I, the materials were like 500 slides of PowerPoint. 
And I was like, this is ridiculous. So I went through the PowerPoints because th that's part of my contract at the time. That's fine. But I also made them learn how to do PGP and how to uh, understand asymmetric encryption. And they had to create uh, an email uh, with, uh, they had to create keys and they had to register an email and, you know, the whole nine yards. And by the end of it, I'm like, and this is the core of security for most of the internet is asymmetric encryption, which you have just learned how to do and have practically used it. I got calls 10 years later saying thank you because that was the core of my career. That wasn't in the curriculum at all. That was extra. Fabulous. Josh, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for filling in today. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. We'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.